Hi, I'm Mike Jones. Can you guys hear me okay? Is it all fine? All right, uh, so I'm from a company called Science that I founded four years ago. We're a $40 million firm, and we uh, incubate and help operate very early stage businesses. And as I was putting this slide deck, I got frightened to think that we did 48 direct-to-consumer commerce companies, of which, sadly, Dollar Shave Club is probably the only one you've ever heard of. So uh, my goal here is to convey you the learnings we've had within those sectors and hopefully save you some heartache. But I do want to kind of caveat my thinking in this. I have never run a retail business. I have no expertise in manufacturing. Um, uh, I don't know anything about selling things in the real world at all. Uh, I only know software and websites and mobile apps. You know, my background is I, I started companies at a really young age uh, in college. My first real job was when AOL bought a business of mine, and I was given a senior vice president title at a totally ridiculously young age, and then got to run all around AOL and learn. So that was kind of my MBA. I jumped into private equity thereafter, just actually sold like two or three different digital businesses for a publicly traded private equity firm. I then came into my space and I think actually held an event here for some rock concert. Uh, and I came at the CEO as the absolute worst time in history of MySpace because the company was declining at literally, literally double digit percentages every month. So when you think you have a hard business and you're like, oh, we might be down 10% or, you know, for the year, I was looking at 10% monthly declines. So just take that in. You know, it's like the solution was a revolver, you know, <laughs> in my desk to finish the job. Right, and, uh, and then you know, reporting to Rupert being like, I don't know if we're gonna compete against Facebook, uh, you know, it's not looking so good. So, uh, so through the MySpace experience, the primary job for me was downsizing the business and selling it off in pieces, which we did successfully in a ridiculous process, and I, I could t talk forever about it. But after that, I was, so, I was so just hungover from the social experience, I decided I'm gonna raise this money and we're gonna go into like selling real things to people with credit cards because fuck advertising, right? That's, that's how I left it. I'm like gonna sell real things and they're gonna slide a credit card and it's gonna be good and it's gonna be easy. And it wasn't easy, but it, but it was good. So to give you a perspective, like our portfolio, there's a bunch of companies. Um, we focused on three areas, marketplaces in that they're still transactional. Someone slides a credit card for something, but marketplaces for this perspective, just think of it as like labor. It's like booking a nurse or having somebody babysit your dog or whatever. Direct-to-consumer commerce companies, these were businesses where fundamentally we were working with somebody to manufacture a product and sell it through a website, and I'll spend most of my time there. And then we did a bunch in mobile because I just, you know, whatever, three years later I forgot how hard social was and I decided I would do it again and maybe we have something good going on there. So the way that I work as a company, the reason why I think I have a unique perspective here is when we work with a founder on a business, whether it's Dollar Shave Club or like, a founder will come pitch me an idea, I have a staff, and we will construct a deal where we'll put in cash, and then we'll put in labor with them. So we'll get involved in the actual operations of the business, and as you can see, over time, you know, the yellow people, which would be the company's team, versus the blue people, which would be my team, my team kind of pulls back, you know, we help hire a dedicated team for the company, and we raise them lots of money from venture capital, and then they go off and go do wonderful things. So the neat part about that for me is unlike a traditional VC that writes a check and then kind of gets a once a month, once a quarter board update, I see the daily operations and the challenges that it is to build these businesses, which hopefully I can convey to you guys to, you know, scare the shit out of you. So let's, let's start with like, you know, why I think, uh, you know, technology entrepreneurs, if, if we pull way back to, you know, four years ago, uh, on why I think entrepreneurs started getting into this, is uh, everyone obviously realized people were buying things online. People started building new brands like Bonobos and Everlane, and venture capital got really excited because they actually saw revenue coming from companies, right? Suddenly, it's like you had this website, and it was making a quarter million a month in sales, and everyone got really excited, right? So they got super overfunded, right? So like the product manufacturing direct businesses got crazy overfunded, and you know, the saddest part about the overfunding event, as I'm sure many of you know, is that the legacy businesses trade at a very small multiple against sales, but venture funds at you know, a multiple of losses, right? And there's gonna be a reckoning that's kind of coming obviously with that. But so why I think this sector for technology-oriented entrepreneurs is the hardest and why there's so much carnage like behind us in venture for this and is the reason why you guys in a lot of your respective businesses have gotten very, very good at it, right? So you take a 24-year-old first-time entrepreneur out of college who's never had a job, right? And they decide they're gonna create the next business of blazers for men, 
and they've never talked to a manufacturer. They know nothing about fabric. They don't understand cash flow statements. They've never thought about debt. But miraculously, they raised two and a half million from a venture firm to go disrupt blazers, right? And then they have, to, they have to get a few things really right, a few very hard things to get right. They have to figure out how to build a highly differentiated product in manufacturing. They have to manufacture a better blazer, right? Then they have to have a really killer website that sells a bunch of stuff. And that's, that's just hard in itself. Then they've got to actually figure out the manufacturing and margin complexities and, and actual cash flow management of buying these blazers and then selling these blazers to people. And then there's money in warehouse and that becomes super complex, right? They have to somehow get customers to buy them frequently so they better get really good at marketing, right? And then they have to not run out of cash, right? And they have to all do this, you know, as their first job. Right. And very few of them hire people that have ever done this before. So typically when you bring a 24-year-old to start this company, they hire other 24-year-olds. And you've got a bunch of inexperienced people trying to figure this out. And which is why the failure rate is super, super high. Like building mobile apps or games, in my mind, is way easier than building direct-to-consumer commerce businesses because there's so much complexity in here. And to be honest, like the alignment of venture capital with the entrepreneur is completely backwards, especially in commerce businesses. Right? So the first thing is that venture capital thrives off top line growth because in theory, top line growth drives valuation. Right? So in the early days of commerce funding, at least in the last you know, five years, VCs want to see growing top line. Very often they would never ask about gross margin contribution or cash flows or inventory cycling or unsold inventory. Right? Because they want to see growing top line because growing top line would drive the next round. And that next round would be at a higher price. And then that VC would mark up their portfolio, right? And so they would provide this really easy capital that, very, frankly, very inexperienced managers would be deploying that would never negotiate debt or vendor payments or cooperative payment schedules. And they'd put all this money into a warehouse. And then they'd push the entrepreneur to sell more. So they'd discount all their goods. Their top line would spike. And then they get the next round done. And then they do it again, right? And this has happened a lot, right? And you guys have probably seen these companies. And you looked at this being like, wait, they're doing 50 million in sales. Their last valuation was 500 million. Who's going to buy this business? How does this work? And so there's a big problem right now, right? Which is that you do have interesting disruptive brands in commerce that sell directly through a website with fairly strong sales numbers, but you don't have a lot of buyers, right? And so there's a problem. There's a problem coming. Um, let's see, what else did I miss here? Oh, you know, one of my favorite is that, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs use equity cash to buy inventory. That is very expensive inventory. Like if you go raise $10 million and you spend $5 million on shirts that sit in a warehouse, that is a super ineffective way to use $5 million, right? And the problem with this is that the bigger you get, the more money you need, and the worse it gets, right? And that's assuming you got everything right on the last page, that you can actually sell the goods, right? But then the last point here, which is just something to note, is that rich people have very rich people problems, and a lot of times they fund companies to solve these rich people problems, and they don't actually realize that normal people won't do these things, right? So to spend $25 for someone to deliver you coffee within 10 minutes is not a good business idea, right? Like, they're, they're funding those businesses. So, you know, I see a lot of businesses that are really great if you have a quarter million a year of disposable income, right? But if you're a normal person, you're just not gonna buy this shit, right? And there's a lot of those businesses. And, uh, and they operate at substantial negative margins. And amazingly enough, they've raised a lot of money, right? So there's a, there's a funny problem. And as I, as I mentioned, there's not that many exits, right? I mean, there's certain companies like Bonobos and Everlane and Warby Parker, they, they should be bought by now. Dollar Shave Club, Honest Company, these are big brands, and they have not really gotten there, right? Zulily sold, Trunk Club's interesting, but like, there's not that many, right? And if, we were all, if all those companies were traditional software companies, they would have been snatched up by companies with 20 times PE ratios, right? Google, Yahoo, whatever, right? So let me talk about the failures that we've learned in doing this, and hopefully they're helpful, right? So if, and remember, my perspective is I'm thinking about something you start from scratch, you introduce to a market strictly through a website, there's no physical distribution, and you're starting cold, right? This isn't, you know, the new line of Varvedos clothing or some new add-on to Walmart's offering, right? This is a completely cold start. So the first thing we realized about cold starts is that if the product isn't crazy differentiated, it'll just never work out. The customers will never understand why you're better than other people in the market. You can't just be a little bit better. You've got to be really loud, like I think when you launch these things. So for instance, we lost a ton of money 
on a yoga wear business. And the entrepreneur convinced me that we were going to disrupt yoga wear, and you know, everyone in Santa Monica was wearing yoga wear all day, and suddenly yoga wear sounded like a really good idea, and all the girls loved whatever tight yoga wear pants, and I think the guy really liked the girls in the tight yoga wear pants, and so <laughs> thus we had a yoga wear company. It was a horrible experience, right? And it was kind of like Lululemon, but cheaper. But then you realize, like, that's not enough, because people, girls really like Lululemon, and they really didn't give a shit about it being 10% cheaper. If it was 50% cheaper, it would have been great, or twice as good at Lulu, it was good. But it was just like a little bit better. And a little bit better online from a cold start, no go. Like, it just won't work. Like, we couldn't ever clearly dictate a philosophy around the brand. And that also brings me to the second point, which is, well, not the second point, but like further down the line there, which was we were doing monthly fashion lines. As you all know, that's the worst idea ever, right? The worst idea. Right? We'd have one month and like everything sells out. Crazy, let's order more. The next month line, what's wrong? Like, nothing's selling. Oh, the line sucks. Well, what do we do with that quarter million dollars worth of stuff in a warehouse? I don't know, Lomans? Like, and, and, that, and no entrepreneur knows that because they've never been in the clothing business, so they don't even know what to do with all this old stuff. They're like shredding it for rags for the staff. I mean, nobody knows what to do with this stuff because like they haven't been in clothing. Right? You guys all know what to do. I could probably bring you a half million dollars worth of goods. You'd probably sell it in like a week. These guys, like, I still have warehouses full of fucking yoga wear. <laughs> Seriously, if you need yoga wear, I've got yoga wear for you. Uh, so, you know, fashion destroyed more commerce companies, or more online direct consumer thieves. I mean, just horrible. Um, you know, Amazon wins, period. We could talk about it forever. Like, don't compete with them. Like, I'm so sorry if you are. I'll bring you the revolver from my MySpace desk. <laughs> But like, it's not going to work out for you. Like, I'm just sorry about it. Like, they will go to the ends of the earth at a multiple your company will never have to put you in the ground. Like that, they are in the we want to win the whole game. There's no extra pie slices for you. They take the whole pie, right? So you know, whatever. Be aware of that. I'm sure you already know that. Um, one thing we found was that these startups would, let's say, they actually had a differentiated product. Then they would learn marketing on like 20 channels. They're like, we do Pinterest and Facebook and Google and Instagram, and then we do some YouTube videos. And I'm like, oh, that'll never work, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of great reasons why Dollar Shave Club worked. But one reason, obviously, was he created a great video. And that video went really broad within YouTube. And then we levered a lot of money to make sure a lot of people saw that video. Like, we optimized heavy against one channel. At the beginning, now Dollar Shave Club spends on basically every channel. But at the beginning, they knew that channel. And I've definitely found other businesses that are like, oh, I'm doing two million a month sales off Instagram alone. Oh, I've nailed crafting on Pinterest. I can move tons of product through Pinterest alone. So you know, my recommendation to startups is like, find where your audience is, assuming you have all the other problems solved that I mentioned this deck, and then Nail one channel deep, right? And when you're generating half a million, a million a month from that one channel, then go to the next channel. Whenever people got too spread out, it just never worked out. Um, One-time purchasers is like the death of all these commerce companies. And I, I bump into so many that are like, when we, when we released the product, we had like a quarter million a month in sales. But the next month, it was like 125, and the next month was 75, and now we're down to 50, and we don't know what to do, right? And so I, I know, and I'm sure, I'm sure you broadly know, but retentions, everything. Like, multiple purchases per customer is everything. Like, I mean, the only, maybe if you're selling cars or mattresses, we could get away with that if it was like 90% margin or something. But fundamentally, like, you need high value repeat, which is why guys like me focus really heavily on subscription, because at least it's somewhat predictable, right? But we had a lot of businesses that when they came out of the gate, we had like super positive signs, we're really excited, and all this press comes out, and suddenly we're selling a bunch of goods, and then every month thereafter, the business got smaller. Right? And so I, all I worry about on almost all my businesses now is retention and repeat purchases and whatever I'm doing, marketplaces, mobile apps, commerce businesses. I want to understand big markets with high retention against a brand. Right? It's a universal kind of working thesis. Um, poor executive and cash management, I mean, do I have to say more? I mean, it's just, it's offensive. And the reality is VCs are not operational, just to be clear. Like, I may be the weirdest VC and that I really get in there and my team comes and like we rally around an entrepreneur, but most VCs like, you know, get a cash flow statement. They, they may not even get cash flow statements, truthfully. Like a lot of VCs get P&Ls without looking at cash usage 
And, and typically, the entrepreneur is like, this is what's happening. The VC is like, thanks for sending. Like, it's not even like an approval process in many cases. So in commerce companies, you can't do that, right? Because when you close that order with Kohl's or with Walmart and they need a million dollars worth of goods, like, you're putting out a lot of cash that might take six months to come back, right? So poor cash management killed good businesses for me. And poor venture investors on those boards contributed to that death, right? Because often I'm the early guy, but the new guy that walks in that writes a $10 million check, suddenly he's like more important than me, and so suddenly like his voice is better. And then I'm like, but the, you know, I think we're out of, no, it's gonna be fine. And then it dies, right? So like, it, it happens, I mean, it's bad. Um, you know, under, not understanding the drivers of the business, I mean, as you can ex I, I explain, but a lot of, like, we saw businesses come out with huge catalogs of goods, but they never really knew why anyone went there, and they sold a bunch of stuff, but they could never repeat it. So they could never find their hand on the wheel to turn a knob. And certain companies, I mean, Dog McKay is a fantastic one. I know you're probably like, what's Dog McKay? Dog McKay is like Airbnb for dogs, of course. I mean, like, don't you know this? And it means there's like hundreds of thousands of hosts around America, and at any night you could be like, I want someone to take care of my dog. And they're like, great, I got a neighbor down the street, take care of your dog, don't take him to a kennel. Like, it happens to be an actually very sizable business, of which I probably shouldn't mention the number because I'm on the board, but it's a big business, right? It's a big business, and I thought the entrepreneur was crazy, but the main point being, they launched that business and it went boom, like big. And Aaron, the CEO, is like on morning news talking about dogs and like huge press and it was like, oh my God, this guy can't fail. Then like three years in, the growth kind of slowed and we're like, what are the drivers of the business? He's like, I don't know. Like, it's just been going. Like, I don't know. Like, why is it slowing down, you know? And so he brought in like a bunch of executives out of eBay and all this stuff and Bill Gurley's on the board and Bill Gurley, well, uh, anyway. So, you know, finally, he, he, he unwinds like the drivers of the business. And now Aaron, dude, he's driving that thing like a plane. You know, he's got his dashboards up, he's like fuel, and he's got the whole thing humming. And it's growing again, right? But some entrepreneurs get lucky with that early kind of like wind at your back, but then when that wind changes, you may not be prepared for what you're gonna hit, you know? So I really believe that you've gotta figure out the drivers of the business. And, and I've had a lot of entrepreneurs that have failed because they just never figured it out. Um, and then inability to scale beyond a certain level. Like the number of quarter to half million dollar a month commerce companies that are dead, that are just there. There's no one gonna buy them, there's no way to grow them, they're just there, there's a lot of them. We should roll them up. Um, all right, so successes. So as I mentioned, like better than products. Like not a little bit better, but better, like better. Like not the same. I don't wanna go compete against something that you can buy on Amazon for essentially the same price. Like that's obviously a losing proposition. So better than products. You know, as you all know, like margin's really important in these businesses. I mean like margin, like wow, right? Um, but venture capital, we didn't really know that, right? Cause we're like software guys and we're like, oh, I, I don't know, like 40% margin sounds great. You can do a lot with 40% margin. And they're like, oh, you know, customer care, returns, shipping, inventory management, warehousing, pick pack and ship, yeah, is 40% not gonna work out. Right, so, and all these entrepreneurs, they tell me this great lie. They're like, well, we're starting at 20%, but at scale, 60 has 70% margins. Fuck that, like, have you ever seen that happen? Because I haven't, and I mean, I'm new to your sector, like only four years deep, but I'm telling you, I've never seen it happen. Like, maybe it happens for you guys, but it's never happened for me. So I don't believe it anymore. So when someone comes in, I'm like, look, if you don't have 50% margin, like, you don't need to come in for the meeting. Like, I don't wanna see you. Like figure out the 50% margin, show me your margin, show me your like profitable on like five million a year sales, I'm excited. But don't show me some P&L. That means you have to lose $25 million to get to $60 million in sales and then you're profitable. No, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Like you lose too much money. Um, so this is a funny one. Like yes, loud and differentiated brand marketing, but I caveat that with what I think of brand marketing and what you think of brand marketing, two very different things, right? So I believe in performance marketing. Fundamentally, like I am a DR performance, track every click, track every dollar marketer. And I love paid marketing because it lets me put knobs and dials to control a company. It's super, super important, right? But I'll meet with these traditional people that probably work for you that are like, well, it's a brand and you can't put value on a brand. I'm like, fuck that, I can put value on a brand. I can put sales against your brand spend. I can tell you if we have value on it, right? But people are like, well, you can't build a brand on performance marketing. No, you can. Like you can build a brand on performance marketing. It's just the people I'm talking with that maybe work for you can't build a brand on performance marketing. But young people that don't know they can't do that, they actually can do that. So better to hire the future potential marketer than your legacy marketer because the legacy marketer will tell you, well there's no ROI on TV. No, we track ROI on every dollar. 
I'm telling you TV, Super Bowl ads, I track ROI against, radio ad, podcast sponsorship, and obviously everything online, and the cost of the video. Right, and I do that, we do that for all of our companies. So when I have somebody come apply for a job, and they're talking to me about brand marketing with untrackable results, they're gone. Like, they're never getting that job. Like, that does not work. So I think, like, if I had an organization, you know, of your size thinking about this stuff, you have to change the fundamentals of how you think about marketing. Like, you just, you, I, I, I really, really believe it. Um, so single and controlled purchase channels, you know, there'll be this interesting story between Honest Company and Dollar Shave Club, right? Honest Company, substantial amount of sales at our traditional retailers. Jessica Alva, in the Target, Costco, selling a bunch of stuff, and the website and subscription. Dollar Shave Club, one place, website, right? Now, my perspective on the board there was like, listen, if you're coming through the website, we're getting used to the subscriber. If you're getting used to the subscriber, I want to be valued like a cable company because I fucking hate the valuations of CPG businesses. That's just my perspective, right? So I push to single channel that we control. My other concern was if I give that product to Target and they go and spend against me, it boosts my marketing rates, fucks up my ROI calculations, maybe won't work out, right? So I took a very distinct stance on that. The CEO doesn't always agree with my stance, and I might be wrong in the end, but Honest Company took the other way. They went with mass, mass. Now the beauty is that you can sell a lot of product when we put it in your relative stores. Right, but the problem for me is I can't control the growth of the company. So it'll be interesting to see how all that value plays out. Like, and I very well could be wrong, but I definitely know that if I'm running a business where I control the marketing and drive the sales and create the engine, I need to control my single point of purchase. Right? Otherwise, I'm always conflicting with my channel conflict partners. Right? Uh, tight cash flow and management, as you'd expect, which is why I think often venture capital really breaks good commerce companies, because they allow entrepreneurs to not understand financing events for buying inventory, et cetera, because equity is easy to spend. And then statistics and marketing and products is a single org. So you know, I, I end up in a lot of these conversations where a private equity firm calls me and they're like, we've got this business, it's stalling out, the doors are closing, Sears is shutting down, and I don't have, a, and like 5% of my business is online, come help me. So I go in and meet with the CEO, and the CEO's, well, I've got this like web guy you know, running the store, you know, and, and then we outsource the tech, and then I got this, this you know, ju junior grade person that's running my SEM budget and Facebook spend. And I'm like, yeah, but like, what are you actually doing? And he's like, oh, yeah, you, they're doing nothing. And then I'll be like, well, what are you going to do? He's like, well, I just got pitched by eBay. I think they're going to be our partner. I'm like, OK. Like, this isn't going to work out for you, right? So I don't think you can bolt on a successful web business. I don't think you can outsource it. I don't think you can hire a firm to do it. I don't think you can give it to a spend management company. The reality is like, marketing should drive sales. You know, if marketing doesn't, if the, if, if the marketing isn't working, you have a product problem, you have a web problem, you've got to change product to match the sales, the sales to be tied to the marketing, it's got to be one consistent ecosystem. It's not like opening up a store in Boca and hoping that all the ladies buy Chico's. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just put it over there and be like, what's the ROI against my website? It doesn't work like that anymore. Like, if you really want to drive hundreds of millions of dollars in sales, it's got to be a consistent single force coming from the CEO down that aligns the whole business. And you're taking data from the website to inform the product, right? And you're taking the product to inform the marketing and the marketing to inform the website. I mean, it's got to be a single system, right? And I don't think you can just outsource it. So things that I would do if I were a brand, um, like, I think the first thing is like, what's a good reason for the customer to interact with you directly versus going to Amazon? And that's a hard question. Amazon may be the solution. You know, one interesting case study I studied was Tough to Needle versus Casper. So Casper became really big, like out of the gate, direct to consumer mattress company. Like who knew? And by the way, wow on the margins. I don't know if anyone's in the mattress business. Congratulations, like that's crazy, right? But Tough to Needle sold primarily through Amazon. And they're both big sales businesses. And I never really understood it. I was like, they cracked Amazon. Like, they're optimizing Amazon as their channel. So they, they maybe decided, like, I don't need to interact directly with the customer. I just want to sell a bunch of high-margin mattresses. And so they optimized to Amazon. And I think it's, good, and it's, it's a big business. I mean, that's going to be one you're going to read about. And those are two very interesting different case studies because Casper went direct to consumer. So for me, as I would think to myself, if there's no good reason for the customer to interact with me direct, why am I, why am I holding myself to that standard? Maybe I really don't need a website. Like maybe I could just sell through other channels. But if you are gonna do it, you know, you've gotta make the purchase experience substantially different, right? It can, you'll never make a website better than Amazon. If you're like, we're turning on one-click purchasing, it doesn't matter. Like that's not gonna solve your problem because I go to Amazon for my groceries, my rolls of tape, the kids' clothes, dog food, you know, juice, 
produce. I mean, like, I go there for everything. I now watch movies through Amazon. I mean, that's amazing. Like, they are a one-stop shop. Like, this is what's happening in Asia with these, like, big media brands touching all these other industries. So you will never be better than Amazon. So you've got to get a very different reason why someone comes and spends time at your experience versus just a standard website, right? I think you've got to really rethink this marketing component and get everything aligned under this vision and make everything super trackable. Otherwise, I think, you, I think you'll just always be firing off half your cylinders and no one will be aligned and you'll never see growth. And I also, I was thinking about, like, if I were in one of these legacy businesses, you know, small acquisitions can change company culture. So, for instance, when, when my company was bought by AOL, it was bought by a guy named John Miller. And John was the CEO of AOL for, like, you know, eight weeks after I got acquired, before I got fired. And John's thesis was like, I'm going to find these small tuck in acquisitions, and I'm going to take the DNA of young founders and inject them into my org and change the scope of the business. And one of the other acquisitions he did was from a friend of mine named Jason Kalkenis. Jason Kalkenis at that point had a big blog network called Weblogs, and Weblogs essentially paid writers like peanuts to make articles. John, on the other hand, at AOL, had a huge force of $70,000 a year well-benefited, employed personnel to write content. Meanwhile, Jason's spending like a dollar an article, right? So when Calcanis got acquired by you know, AOL, and Calcanis is like, why are you spending $70,000 a year on writers? I've got guys that'll do it for a dollar an article. And then the head editor's like, no, we can't possibly do that. We've got this great force of writers, and they've got medical care and all this stuff. Calcanis won, right? And they wiped out that P&L item, and the overall net effect of that acquisition was AOL's content cost dropped substantially. And John was right. So he took innovative thinking in regards to how to do something, and he pushed it into a legacy org. It forced the legacy thinkers to pop up. He fired them, right? And he transformed the org of the business. And it worked, right? And my point, if I was, like right now, like I said, there's all these commerce companies that are at like two fifty dollars to $500,000 a month. You could probably pick them up for like, I know it sounds a lot to you, like five, 10 million bucks, right? You inject a team of like 12, tech-minded, performance-minded marketers, and you give them your catalog of goods, I think they can move a lot of product for you. You know, you put them at our two-year locks, and you just get their DNA flowing in your org, it can change stuff. And this is what leg legacy media businesses did, but they did have to swallow the price, right? But I think because the funding environment's changed, and because all the kind of reasons I mentioned here that why building these things is so capital-intensive and difficult, I think there's a lot of tuck-ins to be done that could change your orgs. So I'd highly recommend thinking about that. Um, if I were a retailer, like I said, I think you have to plan the extreme levels of differentiation. I talked to a lot of like mall owners in Los Angeles, and they're basically like, oh, there's the Grove, where there's this big mall in LA, and there's like a trolley, and like a fountain, and shows, and like, it's like a whole to-do. And then there's like all these dead malls, you know, like with nothing happening, with pop-up shops, you know, and they're all dying, right? And I kind of feel like, well, you will go to the Grove because it's an experience, and these dead malls are just dead real estate. And I talk to these mall owners, like, well, what would you do to get more people to show up their mall? And I'm like, I don't know, turn it into a parking lot for the Grove? Uh, like, I'm not sure. Like, maybe that's a better investment. But I think it's tough. You know, I think you, if you are sitting on a lot of property, I think, I think the world's going to get stratified into, like, commodity dead locations and true shopping experiences. And I think if you can build a true fun experience, then you can drive people there. And I see it, because the mall is, like, it is bustling. I mean, the Grove is bustling with people. It's just, it's unreal. The other thing that they did in the, in the Grove, oh, I do have this on here. This is my bottom point. So Honest Company, very smart company, run by good friends of mine, and they do love subscribers, right? So they opened up, they opened up a store in the Grove, an Honest Company beauty bar. But when you go into the Honest Company beauty bar to buy their beauty, they have tablets, and they try to get you to become a subscriber to their web product. I was like, oh, that's smart. That's really smart. And I was like, what's your cost per acquisition? He's like, it's the cheapest I have. Because they're, they're spending, what, $100,000, $200,000 a day on subscriber acquisition online. And so he's probably buying subs for, what, 30, 50 bucks a sub. But he's saying people walking in there, he can get them to sign up right there with a the sales associate. And he sells some product there. That's pretty cool. Like, that was the first time I'd seen that. You know, meanwhile, I go to a John Barbados store, and I'm like, can you get me this thing that's on the website? And they're like, no, the web products won't ship to our physical store. And I'm like, can you return this product I bought online? He's like, no, our system doesn't connect to the website. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I came by. <laughs> like, I just won't ever visit you again in person. You know. Um, so I think, like I said, with Tuft & Needle, Amazon can be your friend. Like, I think you have to find ways to work through it. 
you know, and I don't think you need to have a religion about it. I think certain products that sell really well through Amazon and you could dominate the Amazon landscape and certain products you want to keep off of Amazon to maintain your direct consumer focus. It might not be a one size fits all philosophy, right? I don't think things like same day delivery matter. Like, and I don't think you want to be in them anyway, right? I mean, it's one thing if you're grocery, I get it, or pharma, or produce, alcoholic beverages past seven o'clock at night, totally. Same day delivery sounds great, right? But if gaps like our differentiators, you can get the t-shirt today, I'm like, I, no. Like, I just, that's not enough. Um, and by the way, Amazon's gonna win that too. Like, if you're FedEx right now, and Amazon's starting to do their own trucks, are you like, oh shit. Like, that's not a good sign, right? I mean, like, Amazon delivers to me through Amazon. Like, not through FedEx anymore. It's just unreal. Um, purchasing being easy is really critical. So, one of the businesses we incubated is this app. This app overserves teenage girls with entertainment content, and they're super addicted to it. So I sit in the very back of the room on these teenage girl focus groups, right? And I'll tell you some of the things I learned. They really hate talking on the phone. They think it's super stupid. And they say things like, well, if I'm on a phone call, like, how, how do I get off the phone? What do you mean? Well, when I'm on a chat message, I'm just like chatting all the time. It's like a constant communication. But I'm on a phone, I have to, I have to like, like I get off, or like, well, how do I end a call? And I'm like, oh, that's right, because you grew up like texting all your friends all the time, like calling somebody you really, you don't want to do, right? It's like when someone's like, Mike, fax me. I'm like, fax you? Like, why would I do that? So my point being is like, if your customer interface is like, phone me, no. Like, these teens don't want to do that. Don't make them do it, you know? The second thing that I realized is they care about their time more than I do. They're, so I feel like they take this perspective. If technology can make the interaction with your company faster and easier for them, and you don't do it, they're upset. Because they're like, I press a button and the Uber shows up. But fucking with your thing, I gotta like go there and do something and talk to people and wait in a line. I have to wait in a line. And I remember I went to Sports Chalet a few years ago to buy some tennis rackets and I was in a line. And I was like, what is this thing? Like, I just wanna buy, I wanna give you my money. Like, you don't have enough people here to take my money? Like, I don't want to come, because when I go to the website, there's no line. You take my money fine there, and you bring me the product, but I go into a store, and I have to stand and wait? Like, that's ridiculous, right? And I think that's how they feel. They're like, if I could do this through a website or a, a mobile app, like, why do I have to go and do it through this antiquated process? You know? So, I, and I think they really feel that way. And, I mean, previously, maybe, maybe we didn't. Um, that's it. I, maybe they would let me do a question. Here's my email. Do you get, can I do a question? Any questions? Nothing? Really? I'll just assume I was that good. All right, well thank you. <laughs>